Welcome to an, another episode on software architecture. Today, I want to talk about architecture competence. And we'll begin our discussion about competency for architects and organizations with this quote by Jeffrey Chaucer, where he talks about the life so short, the craft so long to learn. And what he's referring to there, obviously, is the fact that certain skills take a really long time to learn. And human beings only have, you know, such a short lifespan and there are limits on how much we can accomplish. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day, there's only seven days in a week, and there's only 365 days in a year. So how much can we accomplish and how many skills can we really learn? And I have here another quote by Vitruvius. Uh, and this is from uh, De Architera, which was uh, published in 25 BC. And here he talks about how he perceives the ideal architect. Uh, Vitruvius says, the ideal architect should be a man of letters, a skillful draftsman, a mathematician, familiar of historical studies, a diligent student of philosophy, acquainted with music, not ignorant of medicine, learned in the responses a jury consults, that is, you know, the law and the legal system, uh, familiar with astronomy and astronomical calculations. You know, so the mathematical side of astronomy. So, you know, and, you know, obviously at the time he wrote this, Vitruvius was thinking about building architecture. But we can imagine if we think about software architects, you can add almost every single one of these skills might be helpful, as well as all of the various software skills and modern society information that you would need to comprehend the applications that we're going to build to serve modern society. So this lecture is going to dive into architecture skills. And in particular, we're going to talk about uh, the competence of individuals to begin with, because we're going to be asking what architects are expected to do, what they're expected to know, and what they should be skilled at. And then we'll look at what organizations can and should do to help their architects produce better architectures. You know, individuals and organizational competencies are intertwined. Um, you can't really achieve one without the other supporting it. So, and if we think about it, there really is a lot of different aspects to architecture skills. You know, dealing with humans is a non-technical skill and architects have to do that, but they also have to deal with software. So architects require, they basically require skills and knowledge for both the human being side of things as well as the technical side of things. And if an organization is going to attempt to routinely produce high quality architectures that are aligned with its business goals, then it's going to require an organizational support for repeatedly building quality architectures. All right, so let's dive into this. And we'll begin with talking about competence of individuals. Architects perform many activities beyond directly producing architectures. You know, these activities, which we'll describe as duties, uh, you know, you know, you can think of that as, you know, the primary job duties, form the body of, of what an individual is focusing on. Um, and so you can think about it, you know, individuals learn information from websites, courses, books, and so on. Uh, individuals also learn how to be, become architects just by how they do their jobs every day. And so that gives you an idea of one aspect of individual competence. But there's also the skills and knowledge. You know, the ability to communicate ideas clearly is a skill. The ability to negotiate effectively is another skill, both of which are important to competent architects. Uh, in addition, architects need to have up-to-date knowledge whether we're talking about knowledge of architecture design patterns, uh, the latest uh, database technology, or the latest uh, web technology, the latest cloud computing, uh, whether we talk about quality attributes like performance and so on. So you can look at uh, the duties, skills, and knowledge as really being the foundation upon which architecture competence for individuals is based. The relationship among these three is shown in our little diagram here. Um, and you do really require, you know, to a certain extent, all three. Now, every architect is going to be different. You won't necessarily have every single skill and every single knowledge point. And so everyone's going to have a little different mix of these three. But to give an example of where things might fall into these three different areas, 
you know, um, a job responsibility to design an architecture would fall in the duties category. A ability to think abstractly might be a skill and uh, architecture design patterns might be a knowledge. So if you want to improve your individual architecture competence, you should try gaining experience as an architect, uh, creating architectures and performing other architecture duties. You should improve your skills and master the body of knowledge. Uh, and in particular, when we're talking about improving skills, we actually put non-technical skills there, but really you need to improve both. But many architects forget about the non-technical skills. And so they might uh, have a, a real benefit by focusing on non-technical skills, it might be able to improve themselves as an architect significantly. So let's talk about through some of these duties. Let's take a look at some of the technical duties that a software architect might deal with on a, on a regular basis. So these duties can include um, and over on the left-hand side, I've got a general duty, and then I've got a specific duty area. So on the general side over here, I've got an, an architecting general duty, and I've got other life cycle activities. And underneath architecting, I listed several specific duties. Uh, the first one is creating an architecture. So this would include things like designing an architecture, selecting an architecture, creating a design plan for an architecture, building the product architecture, making design decisions, uh, refining designs, iterating on designs, identifying design patterns to include in your architecture design, identifying architecture tactics to achieve certain quality attributes, um, you know, defining how the components all fit together and interact, creating interfaces and so on. All of that would fall into the category of creating an architecture. Uh, the next category of specific duties is evaluating and analyzing an architecture. So this would include like evaluating architecture, either it's a system you're working on or other systems to determine satisfaction of use cases and you know whether or not you're satisfying the stakeholders quality attributes, uh, creating prototypes for evaluation purposes, participating in design reviews, um, reviewing the component designs and so on designed by others, reviewing designs for compliance with the architecture requirements, uh, comparing software architecture techniques and performing trade-off analysis and so on. All of that would fall in the evaluate and analyze in an architecture category. The third uh, major specific duty is doc architecture documentation. You know, this is preparing architecture documents and presentations uh, to explain the architecture to the stakeholders in the project. Um, documenting software interfaces, uh, coming up with what the documentation standards are going to be, and, and so on. All that would fall into the architecture documentation category. And again, this is an important duty because if you don't document the architecture, then in the long run, no one will understand that architecture will be very difficult to maintain it. Uh, and so if it's worth building, then it's worth documenting. Uh, the next category is working with and transforming other systems. You know, you want to maintain and evolve the existing system and the systems it interacts with. Uh, perhaps you need to uh, bring in new technologies and platforms and so on uh, to meet new requirements. And finally, we've got this category for performing other architecture duties. This would include things like selling the vision of the architecture, you know, marketing it, keeping the vision alive, participating in product design meetings, giving technical advice on architecture design and development, um, participating in software process definition improvement meetings and so on. And basically providing architecture oversight uh, for software projects. All right, so all those categories fall in the sort of general category of architecting, but there are other types of life cycle activities that architects typically get pulled in as part of their job. This includes things like managing the requirements, so architects might analyze functional and quality attribute requirements, understand uh, business and customer needs and what the business goals are, uh, and tracing those business goals to the requirements, um, identifying all the different customer organizational and business requirements and how those impact the architecture, uh, creating software specifications from business requirements, 
um, and understanding uh, all the architecturally significant requirements and tracing them to uh, the business goals and understanding the client's key design needs and expectations. All of that falls in the general category of managing the requirements. Um, the next category is implementing the product. Uh, you know, here, you know, the architect can get involved in producing code, conducting code reviews, uh, ensuring that the software is reusable, uh, analyzing, selecting, and integrating the software, recommending development methodologies and coding standards, and monitoring, mentoring, and review the work of other members of the project, software project. Third category is testing the product. You know, the architect might establish architecture-based testing procedures uh, to support the different categories of testers and maintenance and bug fixing. Um, the next category is evaluation of future technologies. The architect might evaluate and recommend different technology solutions to solve future requirements. The architect might manage the introduction of new software coming in. They might analyze the current IT environment and recommend solutions to solve uh, problems in the current environment. And they might work with uh, you know vendors and others who uh, pro propose these new future technologies to bring them into the project. Uh, finally, selecting tools and technology. Again, related to evaluation of future technologies, the architect might perform technical feasibility studies of new technologies and architectures. They might evaluate commercial products and open source projects. Uh, they might develop internal technical standards and contribute to the development of external technical standards. So all of this really gets into different architect duties that a architect might have from a technical perspective. However, there are also non-technical duties that an architect is likely to have. So for example, on the left-hand side, we've got several different categories, management, organization, and business-related duties, and leadership and team building. Uh, underneath specific duties for management, we got managing the project. Uh, so architects may help on the project with budgeting and planning. Since the architect understands the architecture, the architect may be able to help the project manager in understanding what's going to be necessary to implement that, that architecture. Uh, you know, so the architect can help with budgetary constraints, uh, identifying resources, performing sizing and estimation, uh, performing risk assessments, uh, configuration management, uh, creating development schedules, measuring results, and so on and helping with the schedule. Uh, from a managing the people perspective, the architect should build trusted advisor relationships with every all the stakeholders on the project. You know, the architect should work with the customer. They should work with the clients. They should work with the developers and everyone else uh, because if they're selling this vision of the architecture, they need to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, and they want to be a trusted advisor that everyone trusts. And so the architect's role in many cases is going to be a coordination role, a motivation role, an advocation role, a delegation role, where they are helping to make sure that everyone is pulling in the same direction. And, and finally, supporting the management team. You know, the architect may provide feedback on appropriateness and difficulty of the project, advise the project manager and the trade-offs between different design choices and the requirements, provide input to the project manager in the project planning and estimation process. And really, again, going back to this coordination role, uh, the architect is supposed to be really managing both the technical team as well as the business team and the project management team. Uh, you can see the architect is really being someone who is, has a key role in the organization. Now, from an organization and business-related duties perspective, um, the architect should support the organization. The architect should, um, you know, support evaluating not only the ar architecture the architect is working on, but other architectures. Review and contribute to research and development efforts. Participate in the hiring process for the team. Help with product marketing. Uh, help with, you know, design reviews and help develop intellectual property. From a business perspective, uh, the architect should help support the business. The architect should translate business strategy into a technical vision. The ar architect should influence the business strategy, understand and evaluate the business processes, understand and communicate the business value of software architecture. The architect should help the organization meet its business goals. Uh, in order to do that, the architect should understand customer and market trends. The architect should be able to identify 
uh, understand and resolve the business issues and should be able to align the architecture with the business goals. From a leadership and team building perspective, the architect should be the technical leader on the team. Other people should look at the architect as the technical leader in this area. Um, and the architect should mentor other members of the technical team. The architect should produce, uh, you know, a, a detailed understanding of where the technology is going from a trend perspective. From a team building perspective, the architect should set the team vision. They should uh, build the team and align them with the vision. They should mentor other members of the technical team. They should educate the team on the use of the architecture. And they should um, keep morale high. Uh, both within and outside uh, the technical team and foster the professional development of team members. They should coach other technical team members uh, and mentor and coach staff in the use of technology, uh, working both as a leader and as an individual contributor as necessary. Now, from a skills perspective, there are a lot of skills, both technical skills and non-technical skills. Um, let's take a look at some of the non-technical skills first. Uh, now that we've talked about technical, uh, we talked about, um, let's talk about communication skills. Um, there's both outward and inward communication skills. Outward communication skills are the ability to make uh, oral and written communication and presentations, the ability to present and explain technical information to audiences, the ability to transfer knowledge and to persuade and to see from and sell to multiple viewpoints. Inward communication skills are the ability to listen, interview, consult, and negotiate, the ability to understand and express complex topics. Uh, from an interpersonal skills perspective, um, there's the ability to be a team player within the team, the ability to work effectively with superiors, colleagues, and customers, the ability to maintain constructive working relationships, uh, and work in a diverse team environment, you know, perhaps with people distributed all over the world, uh, and to be able to inspire creative collaboration and achieve consensus. From an interpersonal skills of other people perspective, the ability to be diplomatic and respect others, to mentor others, to handle and resolve conflict. From a work skills perspective, we've got um, leadership skills, like the ability to make decisions, uh, the ability to take initiative and be an innovative, uh, the ability to demonstrate independent judgment and to influence and command respect. From a workload management perspective, the ability to work well under pressure and to manage time and estimates, the ability to support a wide range of issues and work on multiple projects uh, in parallel, and the ability to effectively set priorities and execute tasks. From a skills to excel in the corporate environment perspective, the ability to think strategically and to work under general supervision and under constraints, the ability to organize your workflow and to sense how um, the organization is structured and what it takes to get the job done. The ability to be entrepreneurial, to be assertive without being aggressive and the ability to be able to handle constructive criticism. From a skills for handling information perspective, um, the ability to be detail-oriented while maintaining the overall vision and focus. The ability to see the big picture. From a skills for handling the unexpected perspective, the ability to tolerate ambiguity. You won't always know all the answers. Um, can you take and manage risks effectively? Can you solve problems and be adaptable and flexible and open-minded? From a knowledge perspective, let's take a look at some of the different knowledge areas. You know, we've got uh, technical knowledge areas like computer science knowledge and various technology platform knowledge. And then, of course, there's like organization, organization context and management. Um, so looking at computer science knowledge for a moment, there's several different areas where architects uh, require computer science knowledge. There's the knowledge of architecture concepts. You know, knowledge of architecture frameworks, um, stuff we've talked about in these different lectures on architecture, design patterns, architecture tactics, uh, various standard architectures and, and models and quality attributes. From a software engineering perspective, there's knowledge of the software development lifecycle, software process management, modeling techniques, 
uh, and many other software engineering methodologies and techniques. From a design knowledge perspective, knowledge of different tools and design techniques, um, uni unified modeling language, and other types of uh, analysis uh, and design tools and methodologies. From a programming knowledge perspective, there's knowledge of programming languages and programming language models. Um, from a knowledge of technology and platforms, there's specific knowledge like knowledge of specific software operating systems or database systems or cloud computing systems and so on. From a general knowledge perspective, there's knowledge of the information technology industry and its future directions and the way in which infrastructure impacts an application. From knowledge about the organization's context and management, we've got domain knowledge, knowledge of the most relevant domain to your customer. From an industry knowledge perspective, knowledge of the industry's best practices and standards. Uh, from an enterprise knowledge perspective, knowledge of your company's business practices as well as your competition's products and strategies. Uh, from a leadership and management technique perspective, there's knowledge of coaching, mentoring, uh, and training members of your project team. Um, so all of those are individual uh, competencies, whether we're talking knowledges or skills or duties. Now let's dive into the competence of a software organization. It is not enough for the architect to be competent uh, by themselves. Instead, you know, the organization, depending on how it's structured, can either help the architect or can hinder the architect. And in many cases, the organizational setting is outside the control of individual architects. Um, but it's very helpful if the architect is in an organization that understands how to create, nurture, and reward architects. So the organizational, the architectural competence of an organization can be defined as we've defined it here in this little paragraph. The ability of the organization to grow, use, and sustain the skills and knowledge necessary to effectively carry out architecture-centric practices at the individual, team, and organizational levels to produce architectures with acceptable cost that will lead to systems aligned with the organization's business goals. So here are some examples of what an organization might do if it's a competent organization with regards to architecture. So for example, they might have a designated career track for architects. Um, you know, you have several different, for example, job positions for architects. And as you get better as an architect, you get promoted along that career track. There might be um, a clear statement of responsibilities and authority for architects. And both of these might actually be defined in, obviously, in the organization's human re resources department. They may actually have those spe special job positions for architects and clear statements of what a job uh, architect's job duties are. Um, there might be a mentoring program for architects where senior architects can mentor junior architects and help the junior architects um, achieve um, you know, greater proficiency. There might be designated training and education classes to help um, architects learn architecture. Um, when the project team is putting together a project plan, they might have a defined set of architecture milestones that they put into that project plan. When new products are being developed, architects might be involved in providing input into how the product is going to be defined. Uh, when new development teams are being structured, architects might advise on uh, what technologies need, the development teams need to focus on and how to structure development teams for that technology. Um, and in general, architects might have influence throughout the entire project life cycle. Um, an arch organ a competent organization might even reward or penalize architects depending on project success or failure, you know, giving them a stake in whether or not the project is successful and rewarding them if the project is successful. Um, here are some more detailed examples of where an organization might have more defined practices um, for 
architecture. So for example, an organization that is um, a competent organization might in its software engineering areas have defined practices for quality attributes. You know, um, when you are going ahead and doing a project plan, you should, you know, focus on identifying what the quality attributes are the stakeholders care about. Um, have an area where the architects help decide what tools and technology are going to be used on this project. Um, having modeling and prototyping, particularly for like the user interface and, and usability of the system. Um, have st steps for architecture design and evaluation. Uh, identify the role of the architect during system design, system implementation, software coding, and so on. From a technical management perspective, there should be defined practices for how architects identify what the business goals are for a project. There should be tech defined practices for how architects are involved in, a, uh, in the requirements process and allocating resources. And there should be uh, defined practices for how this, the architects interact with the stakeholders to identify what the quality attributes are. Um, from a organizational management perspective, organizations should have defined practices for a career track for architects, for leadership roles for architects, for creating and sustaining a community of architects, and so on. So to draw it all together, how do architects become good architects? Well, actually, probably the best way to become a, to improve your architecture skills is to get involved with mentoring both from a perspective of being mentored by others, but also from a perspective of being a mentor to others yourself. Because when you help mentor others, you will help learn uh, what it is you're trying to teach those other people. Now, a few people have the luxury to gain firsthand all the experience needed to make you a great architect, but you can gain experience secondhand. Find a skilled architect and spend time with that person. Find out if your organization has a formal mentoring program you could join or establish an informal mentoring relationship. You know, I mean, it's not necessary that we all burn our hands on the stove to understand that stoves are hot. If one person burns their hand on the stone, they can tell the rest of us and we can avoid putting our hand on the stove, stove and burning our hand. Uh, and you should also be willing to mentor others as a way of giving back or paying forward the kindnesses that have helped your career. But there is a selfish reason to mentor as well. Teaching a concept is a great test for determining whether you deeply understand it. And so by teaching, you will improve your own knowledge. Whether you're mentoring someone in person or through email or phone calls or even on YouTube as a, a YouTube video like this video I'm doing right now. So in summary, when we think of software architects, we usually first think of their technical work. But in the same way that an architecture is much more than a blueprint for a system, an architect is much more than just a designer. An architect must carry out the duties, hone the skills, and acquire the nece knowledge necessary to be successful. And the key to becoming a good architect is continuous learning, continuously being open to new ideas, mentoring others, as well as being mentored by others. So thank you for listening to this uh, video on architecture competence and tune in next time when I will go deeper into software architecture.